tonight. Uh, let's all stand. We're going to sing two songs right back to back. Uh, one you may know, um, one you may not. Uh, the first one is, uh, How Great Is Our God? And the next one is, How Great Thou Art. So we're just going to roll right into it. And uh, let's just take some time and worship the Lord uh, tonight. Ah! Uh -huh. 
dried out by the time we're done with that one. That's good singing tonight. It's good to see each and every one of you here tonight. Good to see our young people there in the back. And uh, you guys are dismissed. Let's go ahead and uh, open up in a word of prayer and uh, thank God for our time together. Brother Scott, before you slip out to do the teens, would you pray for us? Go ahead and be seated, friends. Scott, I don't think this lapel has any juice right now. Here we go. No wonder I couldn't hear up here singing. All right. Well, I'd like to invite you to take your Bibles tonight and turn to Malachi again. This will be our final message in the series of The Lies That Blind. Take your Bibles to Malachi. As a uh, general overlook of the book of Malachi, you'll find that um, God's people have found themselves in pretty bad shape, if you will, uh, especially with the Lord. And the reason we have taken a look at the lies that blind is to uh, identify them, to see them uh, if they're in our life. If they are a part of what uh, we are going through, what we are dealing with in our Christian life. And so tonight, we want to not look at, not look at the lies, okay? Uh, but we are looking at what happens when we believe the lie. And, uh, you know, so every point will be uh, believing a lie causes this. Believing a lie causes that. And so tonight, uh, we're going to take a look at uh, just a few more thoughts of what happens uh, when we are blinded by the lies. All right, so number one, I think it's uh, pretty clear to see in our text this evening that believing a lie causes a questioning spirit. Believing a lie, and what we're talking about this in context, we're talking about uh, when it comes to God. When it comes to our relationship with God, and you know, God is the final authority. He is the one uh, that is the giver of life, the sustainer of life, the uh, creator of life, all of these different things. But uh, when you and I uh, believe a lie about God, all right, when that is the, the filter through which our thought processes go, the filter through which our desires go, or the filter through which our motivations go, it causes a questioning spirit. Now, what I do not want us to think tonight, uh, and I don't want to propagate this thought because I think it's a, a terrible thing uh, that you and I are not allowed to ask God questions. All right? That is something that every believer uh, uh, should do, 
uh, has the ability to do, and I even think that God welcomes that. He's not afraid of your question. God is not, God is not nervously sitting on his, on his throne or wondering, boy, I wonder when Ron's going to come up with another zinger. <laughs> He's not worried about that. There's a difference, I believe you and I can, can identify and show tonight, that there's a difference between asking God a question and questioning God. You Kind of semantics there, but how many of you uh, have had kids before? How many of you had kids? All right. So not yet. So little Joanne, she's too sweet, too sweet to have experienced this yes, but yet, but but y'all were kids, right? Like last week, right? Like they just just a little baby. So I still, uh, I always hate it when people say that to me. So I'm just passing on that blessing to you. All right, here we go tonight. I mean, how long do you have to be before you're not a kid anymore? That's all I know. That's all I want to say. Um, but uh, you have kids, so you know immediately the difference between somebody asking a question and somebody questioning you. <laughs> you know the difference immediately. The difference in tone, the difference in the body language. And I think there's at least uh, three things, and we'll look at them in a moment, but I want to see these passages. And tonight I want to get a little interactive. So, uh, Brother Gary, uh, if you would, could you read uh, chapter 1, verses 2, and then verses 6 and 7? And Brother John, I see you slipping those glasses on. I appreciate that. Uh, Brother John, if you'll take chapter 2, verses 14 and 17, and then... It's oh, a shame. <laughs> and uh, Brother Gerald, if you'll do chapter 3, verses 7 and 8 and 13. Now, uh, while we're reading this, uh, each of us will be able to see this questioning spirit because of a lie that was believed. We'll see this questioning spirit rise up to the top. All right, John, uh, excuse me, John. Uh, Malachi chapter number 1. Brother Gary? Do you see it rising up here in verse 6 and 7? God gives them something directly that they have done against His commandment. And their, their first question is like, what are you talking about? Well, how have we done that? Will you, will you, will you tell us how we've done? All right, chapter number 2. Verse 17. Every time God's bringing them something, they immediately have something else to say about it. Chapter number 3, 7 and 8 and 13. All right, so we see at least three uh, areas, three distinctive places where um, God's people came to Him, excuse me, where God came to His people and told them something directly that was wrong in the way that they were uh, uh, treating God, the way that they were treating one another, the way that they were worshiping God, and their very first thing they say is, well, how? Okay, I hear you. I hear what you're saying, but how? So when we when we believe a lie, it causes a questioning spirit. There's at least three areas, and I don't mean to be exhaustive tonight, but at least three areas when uh, we are questioning. The, the the question is, what are we questioning? And the first thing is this: we're questioning the character of God. When we have a questioning spirit, we're questioning the character of God. Uh, throw out 
you know, this is something that, that, that we know, especially on a Wednesday night uh, here tonight. Throw out some characteristics of God. Just give me a, just go ahead and toss them out here. He loves. God is love, right? The Word of God teaches us that. But what would be, what would be not the uh, antithesis of love, but, but on the other side of the spectrum uh, that God is? God is holy, right? And so everything that falls in between the spectrum of, the, of those two things is always true. And God never thinks anything. He never does anything. He never allows anything that falls in between His justice, His, His supreme holiness, and His uh, wondrous love. Nothing in between those two things or on the spectrum. His justice never goes against His love. His love never goes against His justice. He, he's always the same. And He even says that. So understand, when we say, uh, you know, uh, when we come to God with a questioning spirit, we are coming to God questioning not just what He is saying, but His character, who He is. And all of a sudden, verses come to mind, why would the thing made say to the thing that it created, why hast thou made me thus? Think about it. We're questioning God's character. Number two, I think, uh, at the very least, we're questioning God's authority. God's authority. Do you understand that God is sovereign over all things? There's nothing that happens outside of the sovereign uh, realm of our Lord and Savior. I, I, I'm, I'm reading a book, and it's amazing to see uh, he's going through all of the different things that God is sovereign over. You know that God is sovereign over all the elements? How many times did, did Jesus say, you know, uh, peace, be still, he calmed the storm, or God says that he, he makes the wind to blow, or uh, you think about the hail that he brought onto Egypt. God is sovereign over inanimate things, the rain, the wind, water. God is uh, sovereign over uh, uh, the, the uh, untamed creature. If we look back at uh, uh, Exodus and, and, and one of the plagues was the frogs, right? God said, uh, hey, come on up out of, the, out of the river. And against their nature, against their created, the way that God created them, the frogs came up out of the river. They jumped into people's houses. They jumped into people's beds. They jumped into people's ovens. Can you imagine? They just came up out of everywhere against their nature against how they were created because God is sovereign over them. I think of, you think of Balaam's donkey, right? When uh, he was leading him along the way and he kept turning and turning and turning away because he saw the angel of the Lord and then all of a sudden gave him the ability to speak and say, why are you hitting me? I'm trying to save your life, dude. I mean, <laughs> if you think about it, maybe the two words in the King James should be switched around about who was being who in that story. God is sovereign over the animals that He has created. He's, he's simply sovereign over all things. You say, there's a reason why I didn't put God's power, you know? And a lot of times I think that we get this, um, the definitions of power and authority mixed up. This is not, this is not a, a power. It's different than that. Power is, uh, the ability to do it, right? The ability to do it. I, ha I, have, I have the, God has the power. Authority is the right to do it. God has the right to do it. All things, whether they fall under the guise of the measurement of fairness or not, God has the right. Remember, he who creates the rules, rules. God, are, are we questioning his character? Are we questioning what makes him up? Are we questioning his authority? And there's, a, there's another area, at least three here tonight, they've, Obviously, they've questioned God's Word. God's Word. 
So we've moved from, you know, what we've been, what we've been taught, right? What, what, what we've been taught about who God is, about what he does, and, and then, you know, why he has the right to what he does. You know, all these kind of, uh, yes, they're concrete things, they're, they're real things, but then when we move from those, those kind of ethereal ideas, who God is, his right to do all these things, to questioning his word, questioning what we, what we have, what we can see, what we can read, we can very easily see how we fall into this category of, of a questioning spirit. And we have we've fallen far, far away from, uh, uh, from close communion with Him, from having a, a tender relationship with God. Have you developed a questioning spirit? And let's not uh, be, um, uh, you know, naive to think tonight that that time after time after uh, having difficulty after difficulty come into your life, that that it's not easy for it to happen. Because it is. Because maybe after you take body blow after body blow or 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 what have you. Uh, in the area of your life, maybe it's loved ones or your job or all these different things, this is the very first thing that begins to be questioned. God, if you love me, then why is this happening? What are we questioning? That's character, right? You know, if God is love, then why is there so much evil in the world? How could, how could God punish people for evil? What are we questioning? God's authority. And we see that we're only steps away from then questioning God's word. A questioning spirit, uh, believing a lie, develops a questioning spirit. Number two tonight, if number two will change, here we go. Believing a lie causes questionable service. Believing a lie causes questionable service. How, do, how many of you tonight have, have uh, had a boss that was, that was out to get you? How many of you? Nobody tonight? Okay, a couple, couple of honest people. How many of you are that boss? No, I'm just kidding, brother. <laughs> you just felt like, boy, you know what? There's just nothing that I can do. I don't know what the issue is. I don't know what the problem is. It doesn't matter how many hours you put in. It doesn't matter how hard you work. It doesn't matter how creative you try to be. But it just seems like everything that you do falls absolutely flat in the face of that boss. And so why even, what is it? Why even try? Maybe you feel that way at home. Let me encourage you to try and get that right. Talk that out and, and say, hey, let's... This is how I feel. This is what I see. Is this, is this the truth? You know, work it out. Get it worked out. But the same is no different in the believer's life. Believing a lie about God causes questionable service. God, I've lived for you. I have a sacrifice for you. I have told others about you. And so I just feel like that things should be better than what they are. And because we don't see the fruit of what we want or what we think should be, we, like the Israelites here in Malachi, begin to offer God that which is less, offer God that which is polluted. We see the same verses and many of the same verses because that, that, that questioning is also uh, right there with the description of what God uh, says that they were doing. The question really is this tonight, and, and only you can answer it, and I only want you to answer it in, in your heart and with the help of the Holy Spirit of God, are you giving God your best? It's a simple question. Are we giving God our best? Or, like the stories mentioned here, the reflections mentioned here, is our best saved for other things. You know, it's kind of counterintuitive, but, but uh, John, Hannah, 
doesn't deserve your best, God does. And, and vice versa, Hannah, God deserves your best. And then the amazing thing is, as he promises in chapter number three, which we'll talk about when everyone's here, but he makes up the difference when we give him our best and we offer what's left over to everything else and everyone else, he makes up the difference. Believing a lie causes a questioning spirit. Believing a lie causes questionable service. And lastly tonight as we wrap up this uh, look at the book of Malachi, uh, believing a lie nullifies our ability to love to the capacity that was once cultivated. Believing a lie nullifies our ability to love to the capacity that was once cultivated. You know, there's nothing really like a, a newlywed couple that their lives have been plucked from all over the country or in some cases all over the world or some cases uh, right next door. <laughs> but those two individuals plucked out of their homes where there have been victories, there have been failures, there have been mistakes, there has been learning, and then those two individuals are plopped into a home together. Their new relationship, their new marriage, their new apartment, their new home. These days it's a new RV, minimalist, all these different things. People are crazy. Although living over there at the lakes at Fremont might not be too bad of a gig. That might not be bad. Just got to get the right RV. There we go. <laughs> there's, no, there's no wrong that's been done yet. There's no hurt in between those two. Everything is, everything is love. Everything is hope. Everything is excitement. But when real life sets in and, and the truth begins to hit and you know, things get hard or difficult or people sin, as we always do, and we begin to cultivate not a view of that person um, that is correct and true, all of a sudden the, our ability to love that person to the capacity that was once cultivated diminishes. It hurts it. It hurts it. I've seen it in marriages. I've seen it in siblings. I've seen it in churches. You know, it ought not be. And I don't believe that it is, but it ought not be that somebody sitting on one side of the room doesn't talk to somebody sitting on the other side of the room. Or I sit in a pew and you sit in a chair and, you know, don't talk to me. <laughs> Whatever it may be. Churches have split over less. They've split over the color of the carpet. And people by the millions are lost and dying and on their way to hell and the church buries its head in the sand. You know, I think the church believes lies about the world. that would nullify our ability to love to the capacity that Christ wants to cultivate. Oh, that person, that person will never get saved. Says who? Says you? Says me? Who am I? Who are you? The question tonight, as it's been for the last several nights, the last several Wednesday nights, and, and, I'm, and I'm trying to encourage you. I'm not trying to bring you in on Wednesday night after you've been working all week and kick you in the teeth. <laughs> but, but to help you, to help me identify the lies that blind. To identify the lies that blind. And with that, we're going to uh, take some time tonight and uh, share our prayer request and uh, pray together.
And uh, I don't know if that live stream is running or not, but I uh, want to thank anyone that has uh, been tuning in, and I hope you have a great, great week. We'd love to hear from you. If you need anything, uh, give us a holler here at the church, all right?